guys and welcome back to another exciting edition of monday warfare the battles within we are now on episode 23 as we talk raw versus nitro and the wwf versus wcw and i am your host ray russell and we're going to jump right into things this week guys going to talk all about june 17th 1996 both wwf monday night raw and of course wcw monday nitro but before we get there we always like to talk a little bit of news So we're going to get to the news first here in just a moment, and as much news as there was last week on Monday Warfare, there's very little this week, I promise you, so we're going to get right into the TV before too long, but before we do any of that, just a quick reminder to check us out on social media. On Twitter, you can follow us at Rassling Grenade, that's at R-A-S-S-L-I-N Grenade. You can also follow us at Monday Warfare on Twitter, and you can go over to our Facebook account, facebook.com slash Rassling Grenade. We even have a YouTube channel we can go check out old wrestling footage. Lots of great stuff there already at youtube.com slash wrestling grenade. And last but certainly not least, our Patreon account. Head on over a dozen tiers to choose from. It's the all new revamped patreon.com slash wrestlecopia. That's patreon.com slash wrestlecopia. A dozen tiers to choose from. But that $5 all access tier, I tell you guys all the time on our grenade show, that is where it's at. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about early access to many of our podcasts, plus my insanely detailed show notes, unedited versions of many of our shows, remastered versions of the earliest episodes of The Grenade covering NWA 1989. So what was once edited out, edited right back into the show, plus enhanced sound quality there. And yes, of course, as part of that all access tier or any of the higher tiers over at Patreon, Patreon exclusive watch along series covering many, uh, actually all, of the WWF and WCW pay-per-views that coincide with the Monday Night War. An excellent complimentary piece here to the Monday Warfare show, as well as watch-alongs featuring Saturday night's main event, Clash of the Champions, hey, Flair and Steamboat, Clash 6, right there on Patreon. Also, USA Specials, Coliseum Video Exclusives, and a whole lot more, patreon.com slash WrestleCopia, the $5 all-access here. Get you all of that, plus now, yes, there's even more, Digital downloads, monthly digital downloads for your viewing and reading pleasure. Lots of good stuff. So give us a try. There's no subscription. Cancel any time. I think you'll like the offers. And there's more on the way. And as always, you can listen to Monday Warfare, The Wrestling Memory Grenade, Tom Robinson's TR Shocks the World, and so many more podcasts over at WrestleCopia.com. That's WrestleCopia.com and all of your favorite podcast streaming apps. From Apple to Spotify, Google Pod, iHeartRadio, and beyond. You name it, we're probably there. So now let's jump right into things, like I said, June 17th, 1996. But before we get to Raw, we're going to look at some WWF news. And we're going to go here and there as we talk about Kevin Kelly on his way into the WWF. No, not Kevin Wackles, a.k.a. Nails. I don't think he'll ever be back in the WWF slash WWE. But Kevin Kelly, the play-by-play man, was hired as an announcer. At this stage in the summer of 96, he'll probably start as an interview guy, says DeMeltz, but is being groomed to take over superstars in a year or so when Vince McMahon steps down. Kind of interesting that they were already talking about Vince McMahon stepping down in the middle of 1996. We know Vince disappears off commentary permanently after the Survivor Series fiasco in 1997, but Kevin Kelly being brought in, and he was a good little play-by-play guy down there in Florida for Eddie Mansfield prior to this. So Kevin Kelly gets a job in the summer of 96 with the WWF. Also, we talked last week about several wrestlers getting jobs with the company over the summer here. One of them being the dirty white boy, Tony Anthony, former heavyweight champion in Smoky Mountain Wrestling. Well, he's getting a new gimmick here in the WWF, a gimmick by the name of, well, DeMeltz at this point believes the name's going to be TJ Hopper. Eh, Not too far off. It's actually TL Hopper. The TL stands for toilet lid. Hopper, well, that's just another name for toilet. So if you don't know anything about Vince McMahon, One of his favorite things is toilet humor. So this was built for him, the dirty white boy coming in doing a plumber gimmick, which, by the way, also happened to be his real job at the time. Also coming in, one of my favorites, great man, the late, great Tracy Smothers headed in here, and he'll be given a name to the effect of, at this point, Meltzer reports, Toby Joe Royal. Of course, that'll be changed to Freddie Joe Floyd, 
a good old country boy, Babyface. And uh, for those who don't know, Freddie Joe and Floyd, the real names or partial real names of the Briscoe brothers. So it was kind of a rib on the Briscoes. Tracy Smothers on his way in. Also, it's rumored that Barry Windham, get this, guys, age 36. 36, he should still be pretty much in his prime, right? But he's had so many knee surgeries and injuries by this point in his career. Just a shell of his uh, amazing performing self back in the 1980s. And, and even the early 90s, got his stuff during the Watts era, specifically in WCW. But uh, Barry Windham, who had knee surgery seven months ago, at the beginning of the year, into the last year, supposedly is now in good shape. We'll have to see about that. He uh, called Titan up looking for a job and will get an interview in the next week or two. So maybe Barry Windham back here in the WWF before too long. We'll have to wait and see what kind of shape he really is in. And you could add Bart Sawyer. I always like Bart Sawyer. To the list of wrestlers in Memphis, USWA, you could add him to the list of WWF developmental deals. Now I have some thoughts about that one. Bart Sawyer, a little too small, too short for Vince's uh, liking to ever really make it in the WWF. However, uh, I did, you know, Bart was a good little hand. I know he was a friend of Roddy Piper's. And uh, at the same time, down in the USWA, there was another man down there at the same time under a developmental deal by the name of Flex Cavana. You might know him better as The Rock. And before Rocky Maivia ever came to the WWF, he was working down in Memphis under a developmental deal. He was getting ready to be called up to the big times and his tag team partner in the summer of 96, none other than Bart Sawyer. So you have to think that Bart was getting paid to look after The Rock. Bart was getting paid on the side maybe a little bit to have some decent matches, kind of work with him. Bart, no longtime veteran, but certainly solid in the ring for what it was. Again, I think his size held him back. I was a big fan of Bart Sawyer from what I ever got to see him. And I did have access to USWA TV throughout 1996, so I got to watch the legend that was Flex Cavana grow down there in Mempho. And uh, one more piece of news, guys, before we get going with Monday Night Raw. I told you it would be quick this week. It's Vader versus the Warrior. Yes, it happened, guys. At the June 6th Chicago House Show, the Vader vs. Warriors story went like this. They had done 20 second squashes all weekend, somewhat because Vader had a bad hip, and more because Warriors' shoulders kind of messed up. I guess because the crowd was so big, or because Helwig was unappreciative, or maybe because of all of Vader's pinfall losses are getting so much press in Japan, Vader took the Warriors' clothesline here in Chicago and walked out, left, went to the backstage area. And as he got to the back, officials basically told him if he didn't walk back into the ring and do the job, he might as well walk all the way back to Colorado and not come back. Vader listened and he got back into the ring and did the match, but ended up walking out again for the count out rather than the pin. So right now there are no plans to push Vader until the fall and they want him to drop weight first. But the WWF did allow him to do a double count out with Warrior on June 14th in Denver since it's his hometown and a lot of his football player buddies were in attendance. But he did continue to do jobs on all the other house shows. 20-second jobs to the Warriors. It's almost like Andre the Giant in 1989. Vader comes in like a house of fire back in January. We talked about that last week as well on the show. And here we are doing jobs to the Warrior in 20 seconds. Now, we know Vader has bigger things coming this summer by SummerSlam, and, and actually even the In Your House prior to that. But right now, it is definitely not Vader time here and the World Wrestling Federation as we move on to WWF Monday Night Raw, June 17th, 1996, taped all the way back May 27th. My gosh, this is the fourth hour of a four-hour TV taping. You can imagine how these fans feel here in Fayetteville, North Carolina at the Cumberland County Memorial Auditorium. The show opens straight into an opening match. We get introductions right away. It's a King of the Ring qualifying match. As Vince McMahon and Jerry Lawler are on commentary, we see Savio Vega taking on Stone Cold Steve Austin. And a fun note here, this match wasn't announced by the ring announcer as a quarterfinal match because Savio had yet to win his qualifying match that would be taped the next day for superstars. So this was taped, remember guys, way back on May 27th. Well, Savio's qualifying match wasn't taped until the next day on superstars. So technically Savio had already advanced to the quarterfinals before he even advanced into the King of the Ring. You can scratch your head over that one. Steve Austin, to get here to the quarterfinals, gets a win over Bob Sparkplug Holly. Savio Vega defeating Marty Jannetty. And with DiBiase now gone, we see clips. We go back to the In Your House strap match, which Savio Vega got the win. But we have to remember, we go back to WrestleMania 12. It was Stone Cold Steve Austin scoring the victory over Savio Vega. Now, they've wrestled more than those two times, but you could look at this as a rubber match of sorts. As Steve Austin jumps Savio Vega, and we're just a minute into the show. That's how quick 
we're hitting into the wrestling matches here. Does it have anything to do with Nitro? That's hard to say because remember, this was taped several weeks ago, but Austin on top until Vega lands an Enziguri for a two count and forces Stone Cold to bail out of the ring. Austin, though, goes to the legs of Vega with a chop block and wraps his leg around the steel post. From there, Stone Cold works the leg of Vega and pitches him out to the floor. But Savio re-enters the ring and returns the favor, working over Austin's leg and wrapping Austin's leg around the steel post, kicking his leg out of his leg, so to speak. And now Savio Vega working the leg of Austin, and Stone Cold can't even apply pressure to his own leg. Savio trying for an Irish whip, and Stone Cold just collapses at Vega's feet. Austin tries a takeover, but his knee buckles on a body slam, and Vega back to the knee. At least we get some good storytelling here, but Vega for a big splash as he bounces off the ropes and lands on the knees of Stone Cold Steve Austin. Austin finally back up, whips Vega into the buckle, but both men collide, both men down as we head into a commercial break. Then back from breaks, Stone Cold misses a leg straddle on the ropes, and Vega, time to fire up, and nails the big spinning heel kick, Savio Vega style, one, two, but Austin manages to get his foot on the ropes to stop the three. Vega tries to pull Austin away from the ropes, but Stone Cold reaches back and wham, Stone Cold stunner. Out of nowhere, Austin advances in nine minutes of action, and I thought I could have sworn we've seen the essence of the Stone Cold stunner in a previous match, but this is claimed to be the first, very first Stone Cold stunner on TV. It's not yet named that, but it gets the win. Nevertheless, Savio Vega goes down. The first victim of the Stone Cold stunner and Steve Austin advances into the semifinals at the King of the Ring pay-per-view. And we get a few quick clips here before the next matchup. We see a quick Undertaker promo where we're treated to a Mankind Undertaker feud video. Taker says Mankind will pay for his sins at the King of the Ring when the two men go one-on-one. We also see a clip of Jake the Snake Roberts defeating Bradshaw, that's Justin Hawk Bradshaw, to advance into the King of the Ring semifinals to take on Vader as well. So we know it's going to be Jake the Snake Roberts versus Vader in one semifinal match, and we know Stone Cold Steve Austin is ready to take on the winner of our next match here. But before we get to that, we also see a Dick Murdoch memorial clip. Just a 10-second clip, but very cool that they did it. Dick Murdoch passing away two days prior to this Raw episode on June 15, 1996. Murdoch died at the young age of only 49. And now we head back to the ring. It's the other king of the ring. It's the final king of the ring quarterfinal matchup. It's wild man Mark Merrow with Sable in his corner, taking on Owen Hart, cast and all, with Jim Cornette in his corner. And Stone Cold Steve Austin joins commentary, taking no sides. But he really doesn't seem to like Mark Merrow. Hey, Stone Cold, what do you think of the wild man? Sure, Mark Merrow is a credit to the human race. But personally, I just can't stand him. I hate his guts. <laughs> well, pulling no punches there is Steve Austin. You know, we've heard stories over the years that a lot of guys thought Mark was a great guy, a great human being outside of the ring. But a lot of people just did not like working with Mark for a variety of reasons. And uh, by King of the Ring time, Stone Cold may uh, double down on these comments, but we'll have to wait for the pay-per-view for that. As the match gets going, we see a clip of Barry Horowitz, still here in the summer of 96. Horowitz gets a winning reverse decision on Owen Hart back on WWF Superstars when Owen refused to release the sharpshooter. And who was the referee for that match? Why, it's brand new WWF official Harvey Whippleman, of all people. Whippleman, remember, we've seen him out here taking notes in recent weeks. He felt we needed better officiating here in the World Wrestling Federation. If anybody knows any of the dirty tricks, it's got to be Harvey Whippleman. So Whippleman now petitioning to become a referee, which he is for at least this short period of time. And in fact, we'll see him later here on Monday Night Raw. But as the match gets going, we have to remember last week, it was Mark Merrow defeating the body Donna Skip and Owen Hart scoring a surprise victory over Yokozuna to advance into this quarterfinal match. One of these men will wrestle Stone Cold Steve Austin at the pay-per-view. And as the feeling out process begins, we get some basic holds and counter holds. Mark Merrill finally goes to Owen's arm. Merrill looking for a top rope sunset flip early on, but Owen moves out of the way and Merrill takes a hard bump into the center of the ring, allowing Owen to take control and a spinning heel kick gets a two count for Owen Hart. Hart back up, standing drop kick as Steve Austin stands up at commentary. It looks like Mark Merrill may take a bump to the floor. Steve Austin teasing he's going to interfere in the match as we head into a commercial break. And I wrote smooth move teasing Austin's interference to try and keep some viewers through the break. But back from break, we learn Austin has been escorted away from ringside. So nothing happened, folks. Nothing to see here as we're back to action. Owen Hart locks in a nice looking Boston Crab. But Merrow counters into a near fall of his own. Owen Hart then busts out the 
perfect plex foreshadowing the ending of Raw. I don't know that that was Owen's intention, but Owen with a perfect plex here. Centering for another two count. Then Owen heads to the top rope with a flying splash, but lands under the knees of Mark Merrow, and it's comeback time for the wild man. Merrow lands the uppercut and a big knee lift, but Owen cuts him off for a back suplex. Merrow, though, slides behind Owen into a, what Dave Meltzer calls a Japanese rolling crotch hold. You might know this move better as the move that busts the lip open of Stone Cold at King of the Ring. I just wrote, sure, why not, Dave? And Mark Merrow picks up the win with the Japanese rolling crotch hold in 11 minutes. Always loved this move whenever I saw it executed. Never heard the name for it, but we'll go with what Dave says here, at least for this week here on Raw. And Mark Merrow advances into the King of the Ring. He'll take on Stone Cold Steve Austin in the semifinals. Post-match, Mark Merrill offers to aid the injured, broken-handed Owen out of the ring by sitting on the ropes and opening him for Owen Hart, but Hart blasts Merrow twice instead with the cast to lay him out and save face. Owen Hart laying Mark Merrow out cold, making him look like a fool on the floor as the segment comes to a conclusion, and I wrote, I couldn't help but notice the crowd here and what had to be fake noise throughout the match. Lots of people gone out of their seats, possibly gone from the arena, Others are just walking around, no movement from the fans that are in their seats, but yet we hear solid interaction from bell to bell. That's uh, what crowd sweetening can do for you. Now, as for the match, this was the basics of all basics. Very bland, not so much boring, just neither guy really did much of anything. Mero did none of his high spots, and I don't know if it was just Owen's hand or if Hart straight up told Mero, we're not doing any of your flippy shit. I'm not really sure what the deal was here. Owen, though, uh, playing it smart, not going to risk further injury. Uh, they played it safe, and they had a, uh, I won't call it a good match, but they had a uh, they had a match, and we'll put it that way. Mark Merrow takes on Stone Cold, King of the Rings semifinals, and we move on with Jim Ross. We're at a house show somewhere with Jim Ross interviewing the British Bulldog, Diana Smith, his wife by his side, and we talk about the rematch from In Your Hoose. The Bulldog going to challenge Shawn Michaels yet again for the WWF title at King of the Ring. The Bulldog says he's confident, and Shawn Michaels messed with the Bulldog's prized possession. His wife, the announcers question the word possession of a spouse. The Bulldog seems to own Diana. Davy Boy says now he will take Shawn Michaels' most prized possession at King of the Ring, the WWF title. Jim Ross reminds Davy that Shawn is in this arena, in this house show building right now. But Bulldog says he doesn't give a frog's fat ass. The Bulldog says, if Sean has any guts, he'll come out here right now. And that he does. Out comes Sean Michaels, who attacks the Bulldog from behind. It's not a very baby face thing to do, but Sean has had enough of Davy's antics and Diana's claims. And it's Sean Michaels and Davy Boy Smith in a pull apart brawl. Officials pull the men apart on a couple of occasions. And they continue to break free and go back at one another. It's your classic pull apart brawl to set up the big pay per view match this coming Sunday night at King of the Ring. I feel like I should be looking forward to this matchup, given the guys involved, the Bulldog and Shawn Michaels, but the build to the match has actually hurt it more than helped it. Had they just focused on these two competing in a good wrestling match with a little bit of heat, Bulldog wants the belt, I get it. Makes sense. You need a little bit of a storyline there heading into the title match. You can have things like this pull-apart brawl, but everything leading up to it just hurt it, and this pull-apart brawl it just didn't even work for me. Although I appreciate the effort. Even though, and you got to remember, this was done post-production of Raw. This didn't happen at Raw. This was edited in after the fact. So clearly this wasn't even on their mind when we got to this stage. We roll on with the WWF Superstar line. That's the 900 number. And last week I made mention that they used Lex Luger's WCW theme music as the backtrack while Doc Hendricks sold what was on the 900 line. Now, a lot of you might think, well, that was a shot at Lex Luger for jumping over to WCW. That was a shot at WCW for bringing in Hall and Nash. I got to put it like this. Vince McMahon, who probably has nothing to do with this segment anyway, absolutely has no idea what Lex Luger's music is in WCW or the fact that it's clearly public domain, which is just another problem in itself with WCW, but we won't get into that right now. I wanted, I promised last week that this week we would listen to a superstar line ad, and this is the one from June 17th Raw. Take it away, Doc. The World Wrestling Federation Superstar Line is always open and open right now. Just call 1-900-737-4WWF. And on option six, the Ross Report, new talent headed to the World Wrestling Federation. Find out who the five new superstars are entering the WWF. The call costs only $1.49 per minute. Kids under 18 must have parents' permission before calling. Call now. 
Call now. And that sounds good, doesn't it? First of all, you get the Luger music that uh, cracks me up. Cracked me up back then. Cracks me up today. Unbelievable. And then you flip over and Luger's going for the WCW title. And here on Raw, they're, they're playing it as their 900 line music. Anywho, uh, did you catch that Doc Hendricks selling five new stars on their way into the WWF? We talked about those five new stars last week here on Monday Warfare, so we won't get into all of that again. In fact, we talked about a couple of them again this week. Uh, but I love how they sell it like, oh, it could be five big names because WCW brought Hall and Nash in. Who's the WWF bringing in? Well, we'll see how that pans out. But the show rolls on. As we go backstage, we see Mark Merrow on a stretcher, but we see that he is regaining consciousness. So Mark Merrow going to be okay for the King of the Ring pay-per-view. You might be asking, why was he on a stretcher? Let's not forget, Owen knocked him out cold after his matchup with that cast. Oh, that dirty Owen. We go back to the ring. It's the Portuguese Man of War complete entrance with his awesome fireworks in the background. Pyro! For the man of war, they had to burn those things off. Getting ready to take on, well, reportedly getting ready to take on Hunter Hearst Helmsley, but we never see Triple H. In fact, we never see a match because on commentary, Jerry Lawler randomly says that Aldo Montoya kind of reminds him of the Ultimate Warrior. The Warrior has face paint. Aldo, he has a mask. They both try to hide their identities. It's a little bit of a stretch there by the King, but whatever. Lawler says he wants to give us a preview of the King of the Ring. So the king, Jerry Lawler, enters the ring, has a short word for the Portuguese man of war, and then pops him in the face with the microphone, then knocking him around the ring, shoving his face into the camera before ultimately humiliating Aldo Montoya with a big pile driver, the king's finisher. Lawler then looks into the camera and says that's exactly what he's going to do to the ultimate warrior. So Triple H never makes it to the ring. I suppose you can call this a no contest, as Jerry Lawler wants to continue adding insult to injury of Aldo Montoya, but instead we hear the familiar music of Jake the Snake Roberts. And it is the snake headed to the ring for the upcoming matchup. And he runs Lawler out of the ring and back to commentary where the king has a crazy meltdown, cutting a promo on the warrior about what he's going to do at the king of the ring. Good stuff here from Jerry the King Lawler. And I want to thank PJ, PJ Polacco, the former Aldo Montoya, the former Just Incredible for retweeting my pictures and posts regarding this angle between Jerry Lawler and the Portuguese Man of War. One of our Twitter followers even pointed out that, man, Jerry Lawler seemed to have Aldo Montoya's number. Every time Lawler needed to do something dastardly to someone, it was always poor Aldo who took the brunt of the uh, Lawler's insults. And uh, this was no different here, but you need guys like, like the future Just Incredible at this point to, I suppose, help the bigger stars at that time tell their story. And that's what he did here. No problems whatsoever. We've come a long way. We, we did the WWF 93 project. We saw PJ Walker on many episodes of Monday Night Raw, even defeating IRS at one point. He was given the push here as Aldo Montoya initially, and unfortunately by this point, more of enhancement talent. But better things will come for the career of Aldo Montoya. But for right now, again, I just want to say thank you very much to Mr. PJ Polacco for retweeting some of the images and discussion I had in regards to this uh, Lawler-Aldo Montoya angle leading into the King of the Ring. And before we head back to the ring for our main event of Raw, we get a surprise segment as Brian Pillman has apparently signed his contract with the World Wrestling Federation and the cameras caught it. And we head off to a pre-recorded press conference done up pretty nicely. Made it a really big deal here, the Brian Pillman contract signing. We even see Gorilla Monsoon, J.J. Dillon, and others sitting at the podium next to Pillman. We see tons of press out there. As a choked up Brian Pillman talks his recent accidents and injuries that he sustained and how much it means to him to sign here with the World Wrestling Federation, Pillman thanks his extended WWF family to applause from the press and the feed. It ends there on Raw, but the entire contract signing will be shown in its entirety this coming weekend on Mania and Action Zone, which I question, but whatever. We'll discuss this further next week, I'm sure, either way. This was definitely not the end to the Brian Pillman contract signing, I assure you. Nevertheless, though, we head back to ringside. It's Intercontinental Champion Goldust. Marlena in his corner taking on Jake the Snake Roberts, who brought revelations along with him. And before the match can go, I note that the referee for this match is the latest addition to the officials of the WWF, why it's Harvey Whippleman. We also see a clip of when Goldust performed quote-unquote mouth-to-mouth on Ahmed Johnson before Ahmed goes into a wild rage, stalking after Goldust, plowing a jobber through a door. I can't get enough of that spot. But the match gets going. It's Jake taking on Goldust for the IC title. Lots of stalling 
Stalling for days by Goldust here as we get an insert promo from the action zone of Jake the Snake Roberts wanting to help the younger athletes to prevent them from making the same mistakes that Jake did. All right. I won't touch that right now. Back to the matchup. Goldust with psychological tactics, as Vince calls it, as he reaches for Jake's snake. But Jake, he goes and gets the real snake. Revelations. Or at least the snake bag. As Goldie bails yet again, back inside, Jake Roberts smacks Goldust's ass, then beals Goldie and nearly loses his balance while doing so. Just embarrassing here. Jake the Snake Roberts. Goldust, though, slides backwards, trying to back out of the ring, but goes crotch first into the corner, which just happens to be the corner that Jake's snake is also in. So Goldust slides crotch first back into Revelations. Yes, this is happening, guys. Goldust then giving Iron Mike Sharp a run for his money between the stalling and the bailing in this match. Almost no action whatsoever. And we're six minutes into this thing, guys. And almost nothing has happened. Goldust, though, finally posts Jake Roberts' shoulder on the floor as Jerry Lawler spoils the entire Mission Impossible movie in a really douchey move on commentary. Can't believe that. Out of the blue, Jerry Lawler giving away spoilers. Must not be a fan of Tom Cruise. Back to the action, though. Goldust tries to give Jake mouth-to-mouth, much like he did to Ahmed Johnson. But he eats a punch instead as Jake the Snake Looks for his comeback. And I should mention all match long, the announcers continue to tease Mr. Perfect, who will be interviewing Jim Cornette at some point. They're trying to get him right now during this match, supposedly. That's Mr. Perfect interviewing Jim Cornette to find out who Cornette has selected as the special guest referee for the King of the Ring match between Shawn Michaels and the British Bulldog. Early on in the match, Vince claims technical difficulties is the reason we can't hear from Mr. Perfect. But finally, they cut to the Mr. Perfect head and an insert promo up in the corner for the announcement. But we cut away for the finish of the match. The presumed finish of the match was getting ready to take place. Vince McMahon cuts Hennig off and goes back to the match, prolonging the interview further into the matchup, trying to keep the fans tuning in. Jake the Snake Roberts locking in the DDT, the front face lock, but Goldust counters into a backdrop, and the action continues. As they once again throw back to Mr. Perfect, he says he has the scoop. He knows who the special guest referee will be for King of the Ring, but he wants to watch this match first. Mr. Perfect and Jim Cornette will announce the referee at the conclusion of this match. So we're just going to have to sit here, guys, and stay tuned. Goldust knocks Jake Roberts on his ass in the corner, kind of Rikishi style, but instead of sticking his ass in his face, Goldust sits down crotch first into the face of Jake the Snake Roberts as we go into a commercial break. Back from break, this match just continues. It just keeps dragging along. Goldust with a rest hold leg lock on Jake the Snake Roberts' center of the ring. Jake finally makes his comeback, lays out Goldie, but Marlena places gold glitter in the hands of Goldust, then distracts Harvey Whippleman while Goldust blinds Jake with the gold glitter and cracks him with a big right hand to score the pin. Goldust blinds Jake Roberts with gold glitter and then nails a big right hand and pins Jake the Snake Roberts in about, gosh, 13 minutes, and I'd like to call it action. But wait, Harvey sees the gold all over the face of Jake the Snake. And he reverses the decision. Harvey's no fool. The first intelligent referee ever in the history of professional wrestling. Common sense in use, guys. And Goldust, upset of the reverse decision, attacks a blinded Jake the Snake Roberts post-match. But I don't think Goldust realizes that Jake has been there before. This isn't the first time the Snake's been blinded. And we've seen him lay out Brother Love. We've seen him lay out the model Rick Martel. And yes, DDT on Goldust as well. To quote Jake once upon a time, even a fool knows a man only has five senses, a snake he has six. We always do it better in the dark. And Jake the Snake Roberts, DDT on Goldust, a little too late to take the Intercontinental title. And uh, this segment finally over, I wrote, my God, it's insane how much Vince McMahon relied or at least used Jake the Snake Roberts to close these Raws back then. Jake has been back a total of six months now and still moving at a snail's pace in the ring. I'm not trying to rip the guy. I love Jake's psychology, loved his promos. In his prime, he he wasn't the greatest tactician in the ring, but he still worked a pretty damn good match. Uh, But here, unfortunately, it's it's hard to watch him. Lots of laying around the ring. When he's on the offense, it's slow and plodding. Jake nearly loses his balance trying to beal gold dust across the ring at one point in this match. So uh, this is not the first time Jake's headlined the main event here on Raw in recent weeks. I can think of the Bulldog right off the top of my head, and that might have actually even been worse than this, if I remember correctly. But it is what it is, and that's where we are right now. Jake the Snake Roberts 
getting the reverse decision win over Goldust and then laying him out with a DDT as well. And I should mention, we go back, I want to go back real quick to the Aldo Montoya, Jerry Lawler showdown. It was Jake who ran Lawler away from the ring, looking out for the youngster Aldo Montoya. Lawler making some faces and things at Jake at that point. So maybe a little foreshadowing there for the future as well. Before we move on to the next segment here, I also wanted to point out this match. We talked about this last week and everything Goldust has been doing lately from the mouth to mouth with Ahmed Johnson to the uh, naked Goldust promo. Here this week, Goldust in full effect, the androgynous Goldust in full effect here, does the go behind to Jake the Snake, begins feeling around the waist down into the crotch area of the snake, no pun intended. Goldust slithering backwards on its belly into the corner, propping his uh, junk up against uh, revelations in the snake bag. And of course, the most blatant of them all, Jake the Snake in a seated position in the corner, Goldust goes over and sits on his chest, basically shoving his crotch into the face of Jake the Snake Roberts as we headed in one of the commercial breaks. The Goldust character, which had been taken down a notch after WrestleMania, right back into the mix of things. But as promised, the end of the show, it's the end of Raw. And we go backstage to Mr. Perfect, who interviews Jim Cornette. The WWF has granted Camp Cornette the option to pick the referee for the King of the Ring title match in the agreement that Clarence Mason would drop his charges of assault against Gorilla Monsoon and the WWF. And that's what happened here. Mr. Perfect wanted to be the one to interview Corny and announce the referee for the upcoming rematch between the Bulldog and WWF champion Shawn Michaels. Cornette said he had to mull it over. It needed to be a guy who couldn't get tossed around the ring, a man with integrity and honesty that couldn't be intimidated. Then he thought of the perfect referee. You heard me right. The referee for the King of the Ring, none other than Mr. Perfect. Of course, Kurt Hennig puts himself over and promises to call it right down the middle as Raw comes to an end. The last few moments of the final show, the go-home show to the pay-per-view, we learn that Mr. Perfect, the heel Mr. Perfect, will act as referee for the Shawn Michaels and British Bulldog title match at King of the Ring. To say the deck was stacked against Shawn Michaels at this point, an understatement. And if you were a Shawn Michaels fan at the time, you were certainly worried of old HBK's run as champion. And again, I note here, as Raw comes to an end, I wrote, fourth hour of tapings, this crowd was visibly dead and disinterested throughout the entire show. Vince better be thankful for crowd sweetening. So I I mentioned crowd sweetening again here, but in all honesty, if you just watch the crowd rather than what's going on in the ring, you can see that the uh, the noise level doesn't match up to the enthusiasm the crowd is showing, which is, uh, I should say, lack thereof enthusiasm. It's hard to believe we're this deep into the Monday Night War, some 10 months into the Monday Night War, and Vince McMahon's still using not just TV tapings, but recording four shows at a time. I understand it's a major cost-cutting measure, and maybe even a necessity at this point in 1996, but man, they need to get out of this funk, because trying to put together four hours of TV in one night to go up against four live episodes of Nitro, where they can combat whatever you recorded three weeks ago, the WWF were never going to recover if they hadn't gone live every week of course that's upcoming in the weeks and months to come so we won't get into that right now segment of the night guys another rough week for raw here and that's scary when this is how you fill an hour of tv heading into your pay-per-view mark marrow versus owen hart never really clicked for me though though owen is working with an injury jerry lawler's segment with montoya was fine and uh jake versus Goldust, I'd, i'd rather never see that main event again I guess this is, uh, again, one of those default shows where you just have to pick the least shitty thing that happened on the show. So I wrote Austin versus Vega, question mark. And I, and I put a question mark here because of the Austin versus Vega matches, the matches which, uh, don't get me wrong, I enjoy them. Uh, this is probably the worst of the lot. And that doesn't mean it's bad. It was there. It was okay. It certainly wasn't anything, uh, you know, no four or five star matchup. Then again, it was, it was TV. But I go back to it. You're combating against a Nitro. A live Nitro, mind you, and there's just nothing really exciting or or popping right now here on Monday Night Raw, unfortunately. Hopefully that changes soon, but that concludes this episode of Monday Night Raw as we head over to WCW News, and we're coming off last night, the Great American Bash pay-per-view. We're going to look at quick results from the Great American Bash on the main event pre-show on TBS. It was Rocco Rock over Jerry Sags in a minute and 46 seconds. Ending came when Johnny Grunge appeared from under the ring and hit Sags with the cast. To lead to the pin, also on the pre-show, VK Wall Street over Jimmy Powers with the Samoan drop, the stock market crash, whatever he's calling it here in WCW. Also, Hacksaw Jim Duggan pinning the Disco Inferno in just two minutes, nine seconds with the three-point stance. Total squash there 
As we move on to the live pay-per-view, it was the Steiners over Fire and Ice, Scott Norton and Ice Train in a must-be-a-winner match. U.S. champion Conan defeated the quote-unquote South American legend El Gato, a.k.a. Pat Tanaka, in a mask. Diamond Dallas Page retained the Lord of the Ring ring with a win over Marcus Bagwell. Cruiserweight champion Dean Malenko also successfully defended his title over the debuting Rey Mysterio Jr. The Meltzer gave that one four stars. Also on the card, it was John Tenta getting some revenge over Big Bubba, no trouble. That feud will uh, unfortunately continue on, as we'll see here on Nitro. Also, Chris Benoit defeats Kevin Sullivan in a Falls Count Anywhere match. It appeared Arn Anderson was going to turn on Benoit, which may have been the initial plan. However, Arn stuck with his horseman buddy, and they took Sullivan out. This match also received four stars. Also on the card, Sting gets some revenge over Lord Steven Regal. That'll teach you to call him Sunshine. And the horsemen of Arn Anderson and Ric Flair defeated the footballers Steve Mongo McMichael and Kevin Green when Steve McMichael and wife Deborah turned on Kevin Green to join the horsemen after being paid off with a briefcase of cash. Steve McMichael joins the horsemen, turning on Kevin Green, and Flair and Anderson pick up a win there. We also saw they were invited and they showed up. It was Kevin Nash and Scott Hall, well, the unnamed Hall and Nash at this point, the outsiders, if you will, interviewed up on the top of the stage by Eric Bischoff, who promised them an answer at the pay-per-view if, if he could find them a matchup. Hall and Nash want a six-man tag team match of Hall, Nash, and a mystery man at this point to take on three of WCW's finest. Bischoff promised that they would get that match. When the outsiders asked who their opponents would be, Bischoff said they could wait to find out on Nitro, which didn't sit well. With the big mang and the medium-sized Ming Hall laid a gut punch to Bischoff before Nash jackknife powerbombed Bischoff off the stage through a platform at ringside. Quite a sight to see back in the day. And in the main event, it was WCW champion The Giant retaining over the total package Lex Luger. In The Observer, this great American bash was given a 98.5% thumbs up by the fans. Wow. Lots of solid stuff on that show. And you'll be able to hear the watch-along version of Bash at the Beach, including the dark matches or the main event preliminary matches, I should say, as part of the Patreon.com slash WrestleCopia. All access here. Five dollars, guys. Just another watch-along added to the watch-along series there on Patreon. Coming soon, the Great American Bash 96 watch-along. And then just a few more quick notes from WCW's side of things. Titan, the WWF, made several legal threats regarding Hall and Nash, which is why they had to admit at the pay-per-view that they no longer work for the World Wrestling Federation. Also, the newcomer jobber, Prince Iakea, is Mike Hayner. No relation to the Iakea family. No King Curtis or the original Prince Iakea. No doubt Kevin Sullivan gave Hayner this gimmick name here. Of course, Sullivan, a big fan and a, and a longtime friend of King Curtis. Anywho, the new Prince Iakea, Mike Hayner, is a former Professor Boris Malenko student. And lately, he's been training in the WCW power plant. That seems like regression. Anywho, we move on. The Rock and Roll Express, Psychosis, Rey Mysterio Jr., and La Parca are all scheduled for the upcoming Disney tapings in July. Talk about a mixed bag of talent there. The Rock and Roll Express, Psychosis, Mysterio, La Parca. Wow, WCW really on the hire here. Speaking of hiring, Mikey Whipwreck from ECW was uh, looking for work here recently. I don't think Mikey's going to appear in WCW until about 1999. I don't even think Mikey gets a full year with the company before he's back in ECW. It's also reported that female wrestler Debbie Combs will be brought in to work with Medusa. If they do, it's got to be a one offer for some house shows. They certainly didn't work any storylines. And last but not least, Double J, Jeff Jarrett's Titan contract expires on October 7th, and he'll start here in WCW immediately after that. Double J on his way to the WCW. And speaking of WCW, we move on with WCW Monday Nitro, June 17th, 1996, Richmond, Virginia at the Richmond Coliseum in front of 5,638 fans. And as this is the post-Bash Nitro, it's Tony Schiavone and Larry Zbysko kicking off Hour 1. Tony announces he will be here for Hour 2 as well. Tony here all night long is Eric Bischoff selling the injuries from the powerbomb off the stage at the pay-per-view. We see a recap of some of the matches from the Bash. As Tony calls what happened to Eric Bischoff the worst thing he's ever seen in wrestling. Schiavone says the war is on. As we see clips of Hall and Nash, being interviewed by Bischoff, they essentially show the entire interview segment outside of the powerbomb spot, which we'll talk about later on in this episode of Nitro. 
Zabisco talks about the human game of chess and has words for the still unnamed Holland Nash. He says he's not impressed with what they did to Skinny Bischoff, and they're not welcome here. In WCW, as we head to the ring, it's Rick Steiner taking on Stevie Ray of the Harlem Heat. How's that for continuity? Last week, it was Scott Steiner and Booker T. This week, Rick Steiner taking on Stevie Ray. And I wrote, can this be as good as Scotty versus Booker? I mean, I have faith in Rick Steiner, but Stevie Ray, I don't know. Stevie jumps Rick Steiner to begin things and mauls him. You don't see that too often, sending Rick Steiner upside down with a nasty clothesline. Ray then, though, runs into an overhead belly-to-belly from Steiner and lands right on his head. Stevie Ray simply too big to be taken, an overhead belly-to-belly like that. And Rick Steiner right away to the top rope, leaps off, flying bulldog off the top rope, hell of a finisher, but only gets a two count. Rick pops up and runs at Stevie Ray, but runs right into a power slam from Ray. Really nice stuff here from Stevie Ray, but Stevie misses a forearm off the middle rope, and once he's back to his feet, runs right into a Steiner line, which ends things abruptly in only two minutes and 15 seconds. Wow. Booker T, though, attacks immediately after the match, as it looks like it's going to be a two-on-one attack, Harlem Heat on Rick Steiner, but Scott Steiner out to make the save, but he eats a Booker T scissor kick to the face, and the crowd pops huge for this spot. It was a cool spot. Scissor kick right to the face, laying out the Steiners as Harlem Heat looking for their double team move. Stevie Ray trying to pick Rick up over his shoulder so that the Booker can come off the top rope, but Stevie having problems getting Rick Steiner up there and just power bombs him, drops him on the mat, and has to ad lib with a Boston Crab. So Stevie Ray has Rick Steiner in a Boston Crab position, Booker looking to dive off the top rope onto the back of Rick, but Scott Steiner back rushes in and dives on top of his brother. He tries to save Rick Steiner, jumping on the top of brother Rick. Booker jumps off the top rope anyway and lands on Scott instead. Well, sort of. Could have made it look a little more realistic, but Booker protecting Scott Steiner here. Nevertheless, they sell it like Booker dropped a knee into the back and ribs of Scott Steiner, but really he landed on his feet kind of and sort of punched Scott, but It is what it is, nevertheless. I was pleasantly surprised with how good Stevie Ray kept up here, but the match was over as fast as it started, so it didn't leave a lot of time to put me to sleep with any slow, plotting, big man stuff here. And I was honestly shocked by the finish and how quick it happened, and and we're sticking to the two-minute matches, it appears, thus far anyway on the show. We got a lot of those last week on Nitro. And then Scott Steiner and Booker T both running and presumably setting up some future matches, but in the short term, this plays into Scott Steiner going into a WCW title match tonight against the Giant in the main event. Scott Steiner now having to sell his back and ribs going into his title match with the Giant later here tonight. So the match was so short, it didn't have time to be bad. And I thought these two worked well together. And I'll say the same thing I said again this uh, last week. I'll say it again this week. Clearly the Steiners get along with or like or or whatever you want to call it. The Steiners willing to work and cooperate with Harlem Heat, not just selling for them, but giving them some really big spots. Rick Steiner planting Stevie Ray with that bulldog and allowing him to kick out. And even though Stevie did the quick job here to a Steiner line, both weeks, the Harlem Heat have looked very capable and honestly on par with the Steiner brothers. In both cases, it really feels like either man could possibly win. So good job there by the Steiners. Good job there by Harlem Heat. We'll see more of them in the weeks to come as we go into a WCW commercial bumper. We get a promo with the American Males. They've got the Horsemen in the ring tonight. And tonight, they're going to give Arn and Benoit the clap. Oh, yeah. Back from break, it's Disco Inferno heading to the ring, and his opponent, well, we were supposed to see it last week, but here it is, guys. It's time for the debut of Desperado Joe Gomez, and I can't wait. But wait, before Gomez can come out, Disco asks them to cut his music. Everybody came to see Disco dance, so hit his music. Well, that didn't really make a whole lot of sense. But instead of Disco's music returning... We hear unfamiliar music, guys. Instead, one week in the making, we finally get the debut of Joe Gomez, who many years ago, as a teenager, 18, 19, something like that, wrestled in WCW in the latter half of 1990, beginning of 91, under the name Alan Iron Eagle. And I'm not going to lie, guys, uh, being a young kid, 10, 11 years old, I was a a big fan. I wasn't a big fan, but I was a fan of of Alan Iron Eagle back in 1990, WCW, young kid at the time, trying to cut his teeth on the business. And uh, I, I solidly got behind him, though he wasn't there for just a cup of coffee. Uh-huh. But as quick as he came in 90, he was gone by the beginning of 1991. And you can imagine my surprise when I found out that this Joe Gomez character was the same Alan Iron Eagle that I had seen six years prior. Unbelievable. 
And here he is back. Joe Gomez, more filled out here in 1996, and yet somehow with even less talent, it would appear. And out comes Joe Gomez, my first look at the Desperado, and I wrote, this is Joe Gomez? This is the Desperado? As the match gets going, I wrote, not very good from either end. Crap moves and bumps for the most part. Disco ducks a crossbody, and Gomez lands across the top rope. Disco Inferno takes over, but he's more worried about his hair and dancing and finally runs into a Gomez boot in the corner. Joe Gomez for a comeback, but telegraphs a backdrop with Disco countering and a swinging neckbreaker. I wrote, isn't, isn't that his finisher? But instead of making the cover, Disco does some more dancing. Finally, the Inferno covers. Nonchalantly, I should add, laying across the chest of Gomez, who turns it into a crucifix for the win in just 3 minutes and 31 seconds. Now, that's an effective finisher. Remember the 1-2-3 kid pinning Ted DiBiase with that back in 1993, just for example. But here, eh. They try and hype Joe Gomez. They try and hype this guy. And then he doesn't even beat Disco, of all people, with a finisher, but rather gets lucky with a crucifix counter in his debut in the ring. I wrote, it didn't really help his case, but neither did the fact that he appeared to suck, uh, which is sad considering he's been in the business like eh, six years. And what may be the worst part of the match, Disco Inferno, n not caring about the wrestling at all during the match, does the job, but he gets up, looks at his hair and says, hey, it's okay that I lost because my hair is still in place. And that's where we are with the Disco Inferno right now as we throw to Mean Gene Okerlund, who is standing by with Ric Flair, along with Woman, Miss Elizabeth, and now Deborah McMichael as well. We learn that the Macho Man has been reinstated, and he will take on Ric Flair right here tonight on Monday Nitro. Flair says that Savage wants his money back, and more importantly, he wants Elizabeth back. Flair repeatedly sells the girls and promises to hurt Savage tonight. He's standing his ground. He doesn't fear the macho man. Woo! Back to the arena, it's Tony Schiavone on commentary. He informs us WCW has put the top six names in WCW into a hat, and there will be a drawing later tonight to determine which three men will wrestle Scott Hall, Kevin Nash, and their mystery partner at the Bash at the Beach pay-per-view. And at this point, they haven't mentioned these six names. Who are these six guys? So I guessed here. And we'll find out who they are later in this show, but right here at this point, I guessed Hogan, Savage, Luger, Sting, Flair, and the Giant. Of course, Giant being WCW champion, I wasn't sure if he was one of the six, but those are the six I wrote down right here in my notes, and we'll have more on that later in this episode of Nitro, but first we go back to the ring. It's the American Males getting ready for some clap, taking on the team of Arn Anderson and Chris Benoit. Benoit rocking some bruised makeup. After his Falls Count Anywhere match with Kevin Sullivan yesterday at Great American Bash, and being in Richmond, Virginia, we're in Crockett country, which means we're also in Horseman country, and the crowd pops huge for the heels here as Arn knocks Bagwell off the apron to begin the match. However, Anderson does run into issues early after getting too cocky, and the males take control of the match. Anderson finally manages to tag out, with Benoit now stepping in the ring with Bagwell, and some impressive counters here from both guys, escaping an over-the-shoulder backbreaker as Bagwell into an arm drag. Very Lucha-like. Bagwell also countering a hip toss with a backflip. Marcus really trying to improve his game here in 1996 at this stage of his career. Bagwell looks for a big splash but lands under the knees of Chris Benoit and the heels finally take over control of the match. The horsemen try a double team on Bagwell but the males use it to their advantage. Scotty Riggs dropkicking Arn Anderson into a Bagwell backslide for a two count. Bagwell then busts out the old fisherman suplex finisher. And I'm sorry, every time I see this finisher, I just hear Jesse Ventura talking about Sprayberry High School. That was where Bagwell went to high school. Sprayberry High School. Ventura brought it up like every week on TV, and I just always remember during those Bagwell squashes, which here we are, looking back to 1996 here. Bagwell with the fisherman suplex, but Benoit in to break it up before Anderson can do the job. Benoit tags in and chops the living shit. Out of Bagwell, I've seen some nasty chops, and this is going to be right near the top of the list. And then stomps Bagwell down to the corner to the crowd's approval. They're cheering the heels. They love the horsemen. Benoit slamming Bagwell's center ring, diving headbutt connects, and boy did it ever. If there was ever a legitimate finishing diving headbutt, this one was it. Holy shit. But Scotty Riggs in to break up the cover. Bagwell finally manages to get the hot tag out to Scotty Riggs, but the crowd's still solidly behind the horsemen. We see the males bust out the old double dropkick spot. 
Shivani yells, that's their finisher. Double drop kick to Chris Benoit, but Arn Anderson in this time to break up the count. And as the referee tries to separate things, we see Arn Anderson with a cheap shot back elbow from the apron to the back of Scotty Riggs' head. Benoit then picks Riggs up in a suplex, drops him ribs first across the top rope. Nasty spot, nasty landing across that top rope with Scotty Riggs. Benoit makes the cover. Horsemen pick up the win, 5 minutes and 47 seconds. No mention of Brian Pillman here. However, the announcers put over that there are indeed four horsemen now. That would be Flair, Arn Benoit, and of course, Steve McMichael. You know, I've read it in the dirt sheets, but it's absolutely undeniable. Marcus Bagwell, very impressive as a late here in 1996. Too bad he winds up joining the NWO and picks up all the uh, wrong habits to be a credible professional wrestler. Maybe a better sports entertainer after joining the NWO, but Bagwell really coming into his own as a wrestler here by 1996, looking really good and certainly outshining his partner, Scotty Riggs, at this point. And I had been a Riggs fan prior when he was Scott Studd down in uh, USWA or even even on the underneath here in WCW, but here he is Scotty Riggs. And unbelievably, Marcus Bagwell showing some really good stuff here this week. Uh, really impressed with him as of late. Quite a, quite a few decent uh, matches Bagwell's been putting together. Post-match, the Horsemen remain in the ring. Has been Juan Anderson do an interview with me and Gene Okerlund. Gene and Arn Anderson talk about the addition of Mongo to the Horsemen. Arn acknowledges the Horsemen fans here in Richmond. He says they back the Horsemen because they do what they say they're going to do. Chris Benoit, meanwhile, says that Kevin Sullivan failed at his quest to try and split up the Horsemen. The Horsemen are about guts, glamour, and glory. Mean Gene spots a Horseman fan in the crowd. Hey, you're three fingers short. Oh, Mean Gene. And as we head into a commercial break, we have a bumper promo from John Tenta. Of course, he defeated Big Bubba last night at the Great American Bash. They have a rematch coming up after the break here on Nitro. Tenta admits that he and Bubba have gotten some of each other, but tonight we will see who ends it once and for all. Oh, we'll see something, all right. And after the break, as promised, though they didn't have to keep their word, I wouldn't have held them to it. It is John Tenta taking on Big Bubba, no trouble. With Jimmy Hart in his corner, it's a rematch from last night's Great American Bash. Not exactly sure why we need one, but here it is. Still with a half a head of hair and no theme music. John Tenta making his way out to the ring to take on Biker Bubba. Bubba tries to attack Tenta to begin the match, but fails. And it's Tenta with a big backdrop and a drop kick by the former Earthquake sending Bubba out of the ring. Back inside Bubba with an Irish whip. Tenta hitting the corner hard. Bubba does the old boss man slide out of the ring. Big Bubba's supposed to trip up John Tenta in the ring, but before he can, there's still steps in the way. So while Bubba's trying to move the steps out of the way to perform the move, Tenta takes the trip bump without even being tripped. It's just as bad as it sounds. Jimmy Hart distracts the referee while Bubba crotches Tenta into the steel post to take control. Bubba then doing his token boss man style offense, but at half the normal speed. I wrote, sigh. Tenta manages to escape a chin lock and comes back with a pair of avalanche splashes in the corner, but the referee again too busy with Bubba, and Jimmy Hart sneaks in and blasts Tenta in the back with the megaphone. But Tenta no-sells the megaphone shot and goes after his former manager Jimmy Hart. Tenta with an atomic drop on poor Jimmy. Tenta turns around, Bubba charges right at him, but the former shark turns it into a power slam but they're not in position for the finish. So Tenta, he picks the boss man back up again for a second power slam. This time Tenta putting his feet on the ropes for leverage for no real apparent reason. Bubba was out of it. Tenta gets the win. Four minutes and 39 seconds, but it doesn't end there, guys. Oh no. Post-match, John Tenta chasing Jimmy Hart around ringside and into the ring. Hart hands off a loaded sock of change to Big Bubba, who just beats the living fuck out of Tenta's face and body with it. I wrote, holy fuck, right in the face as hard as he could. He swings this sock of change. I wrote, Jesus. And just in case you question the reality of it, as I did at first, at first I said, man, that sounds like change. And they're selling it like it's quarters, dollars, half dollars, whatever your case may be. But I'm wondering what could be in this sock that they could gimmick it to where he could beat him in the face as hard as he was doing it and it'd still be safe. And I'm thinking with that impact, how can you fake it? But just in case you question the reality of this segment, Big Bubba empties the sock, dumping the quarters all over the chest of John Tenta. I wrote, holy shit. He literally beat him in the face as hard as he possibly could 
with a sock of quarters. I wrote, no thanks. Easily the stiffest thing I may have ever seen in the ring. And these two guys were friends. Absolutely unbelievable. Has to be seen to be believed. And we see Mean Gene Oakland ringside. He says he was supposed to interview John Tenta, but instead he gets Big Bubba Rogers and Jimmy Hart. Bubba again buries Tenta in the promo, calling him a beached whale and a fat piece of trash. <sighs> Boss man style. Big Bubba still burying John Tenta, and this feud will continue. To a commercial break and back, and now it's Mean Gene in the locker room. Man, this guy is everywhere. Mean Gene now with the macho man Randy Savage. Yes, guys, he's finally back. The macho man's going to take his time with the Nature Boy tonight. It is Savage and Flair coming up next here at the beginning of Hour 2. Savage says that Ric Flair is preoccupied with the women, and Savage will put him down. Mean Gene asks the macho man if he sought treatment while he was away. Savage said yes, he did. He saw a female psychiatrist, and she said Savage was OCD. One cool dude, uh aha. Nice from the macho man. The macho man is back as Hour 2 begins. Bobby Heenan tries to join the commentary team, but as the Macho Man makes his way out for the upcoming match, he runs Heenan off momentarily. And apparently, at least for the short term, Larry Zabisco is going to stick around on commentary, so I guess it takes Tony Giovanni and Larry Zabisco to replace Eric Bischoff. I'm not really complaining. Tony, Larry, Bobby Heenan on the call. We don't see that trio very often, if at all. And I'll take it for the time we get it here as we kick things off with Hour 2. It is the Macho Man Randy Savage back in the ring, taking on the Nature Boy Ric Flair accompanied by Elizabeth, woman, and now Deborah McMichael as well. And we learn a couple of things here. Apparently, the Macho Man agreed to undergo counseling and therapy to be granted his return to the ring. Meanwhile, we also learn that Ric Flair, the money Ric Flair paid Steve McMichael to make the turn at the Great American Bash was actually the Macho Man's money that he had to give to Miss Elizabeth. And then in classic Larry Zabisco fashion, he has to hard sell the prenuptial agreements, guys. Before the match can begin, Ric Flair on the microphone at ringside taunting the Macho Man. He says Savage is facing the agony of pain, defeat, and divorce. Savage responds to the mic as well, simply telling Ric Flair, I'm going to kick your ass. Savage leaps out of the ring and attacks Ric Flair in the aisle. Both men still in their entrance robe and jacket, and Ric Flair rolls into the ring. Savage shoots him hard into the corner, looking for the old Flair backdrop, but Ric Flair will not take the backdrop with his robe on. I wrote LOL, very noticeable. So the fight goes on until Flair can get his robe off. Then he takes the backdrop and out to the floor as we head into a commercial break. Back from break, Flair holds Savage while Elizabeth slaps him at ringside. Wow, the nature boy then tosses Savage over the barrier into the crowd. But Savage, instead of snapping into a Slim Jim, he snaps at Ric Flair and chases after the nature boy into the aisleway, beating him down and at the VIP table, dumping champagne on him and all. From there, Savage works over Flair in the ring. We get the Flair flip over the top rope to the outside. The Macho Man goes up top for the double axe handle to the outside, but misses. The Macho Man going throat first across the guardrail. Steamboat's revenge, aha! So the Macho Man coming off the top with the double axe. Flair out of the way, and Savage crashes into the guardrail hard. Both men down on the outside for our second commercial break. Then back from break again, the Macho Man nose sells Ric Flair's chops and keeps popping up but runs into a back elbow from the Nature Boy. Rick then climbs to the top rope, but we don't get our typical Ric Flair slam off the top rope spot. Instead, Savage is all the way across the ring, and there's some kind of miscommunication here. Savage finally sees Rick on the top rope, begins to rush over to do this spot. At the same time, Rick leaps off and takes a nasty bump into the middle of the ring. Missed time spot there by both guys. Flair then, though, goes into his boot, grabs a foreign object, and boom, nails the Macho Man. Out cold, but Ric Flair only grabs a two count after that shot with the foreign object and the Macho Man back up with a high knee into the back of Flair, sending Flair into referee Randy Anderson, thus sending Randy Anderson out to the floor. And with Flair down on the mat, the Macho Man heads to the top rope and it's time for the flying elbow smash and it connects. But Savage, he doesn't want to beat Flair. He wants to beat Flair. If you get what I mean, he wants to maim the nature boy. So instead of going for the cover, the referee's out anyway, Savage ascends the top rope a second time. But this time, the ladies enter the ring to stop him. It's Elizabeth and Woman and even Deborah McMichael blocking Savage from taking the leap onto the Nature Boy, but nothing's going to stop the Macho Man. And he goes for the flying elbow anyway. As the ladies scurry away, Savage connects with the second flying elbow down onto Ric Flair. And it's horseman time as Chris Benoit hits the ring first. 
But immediately, Benoit eats a pile driver from the Macho Man. Then it's Arn Anderson in, and Arn Anderson right back out. Savage pitches Anderson right back out to the floor. Then from behind, look out, there's a fourth horseman now, Mach. It's Mongo from behind with the briefcase. And he cracks it over the back of Savage. Savage must not have liked the shot too much, so he gets up and takes it again. This time, right across the forehead, Mongo blasts the Macho Man with the briefcase and drags Flair on top before Arn Anderson rolls Randy Anderson, no relation, back into the ring, Randy Anderson making the one, the two, and the three. It took all four horsemen, but they beat the Macho Man in his reinstatement match. Mongo, in his first full night as a horseman, makes an impact immediately, and Flair will steal the win in about 12 and a half minutes. Ric Flair defeats the Macho Man Randy Savage, and this feud will continue. Post-match, we see Steve Mongo McMichael put on his four horsemen shirt to make it known within the city of Richmond that he is indeed the latest member of the Horsemen, and they beat down the Macho Man. And Demelz notes that Randy Savage's ban, his quote-unquote ban from wrestling, was actually lifted based on WCW losing the previous Monday's ratings to Raw. Remember, Kevin Nash made his debut, and Nitro still lost in the ratings. And Meltzer claims that Savage's ban was lifted specifically for a ratings purposes here, and nothing to do with the original long-term planning of how they were going to do the Flair and Macho Man feud. In fact, Meltzer called this match the key in the ratings for this week, June 17th. And we're back to the locker room yet again. Mean Gene Okerlund this time standing by with Kevin Sullivan, Jimmy Hart, and WCW champion The Giant. Jimmy says he told Kevin he couldn't trust any of the horsemen, including Arn Anderson. A bruised-faced Kevin Sullivan, no, that's just makeup, guys, declares war on the horsemen. The Giant then asks if the horsemen are the elite, then why is he the WCW champion? The Giant says the horsemen are just jealous and incompetent of taking the belt off of him. Giant challenges any number of the horsemen. He'll put them all down. Mean Gene then ponders the physical condition of Scott Steiner for the main event tonight when he challenges the Giant for the title. Gene hard sells the three big names being drawn to face Hall, Nash, and a third man at the Bash at the Beach pay-per-view. Kevin Sullivan says WCW comes before the horsemen and he is on board against the outside group. So even Kevin Sullivan here putting the invasion over as a bigger deal than his own personal issues with the Horsemen. Sullivan, of course, the booker, but uh, making sure to really get over the importance of these outsiders coming into the company, even more important than my own personal agenda. So really good stuff there by Kevin Sullivan. The Giant uh, never was the greatest promo. And you can point out all the flaws that Sullivan appears to be making from time to time here as booker of WCW, but one thing he knows, it's how to tell a story at the end of the day, and Sullivan knows the importance of this uh, upcoming NWO angle, and he's going to make it work no matter what. We'll talk about that as the weeks progress, but right now, it's just really intelligent promo here by Kevin Sullivan, who has all the heat in the world with Chris Benoit, of course, the rest of the horsemen, Arn Anderson, even Ric Flair, but he stops for just that moment to talk about a far worse danger to WCW, a far worse danger to Kevin Sullivan, the Dungeon of Doom, and WCW as a whole, that being Hall and Nash and whomever this third man is going to be, Kevin Sullivan knows this is not good for the company, it's not good for business, well it is good for business, but it's not good for business kayfabe wise, and just a, a really good promo here by Kevin Sullivan. Hey guys, our world is about to change, and I just, I just noticed this, we didn't get a Glacier promo last week, no blood runs cold last week, and I'm kind of pissed about that. But blood runs cold this week. Glacier coming to WCW, and we finally get a start date, guys. Well, kind of. Glacier coming July 1996. Why, that's next week. Next week's episode of Nitro, July 1st. So we can see Glacier any time here, any time now here in WCW. Of course, that's going to change. But as of this week, Glacier coming to WCW next month, July 1996. But you know what else is coming in July of 1996? Blood may just have to run cold a little longer. And it's at this point, I just now noticed Larry Zabisco gone from commentary, so it is just Tony and Bobby Heenan at this point. We see video stills of Hall and Nash powerbombing Bischoff off the stage, and through that table or that partition, we learn that Bischoff is somewhere in a hospital. Bobby Heenan discusses the devastating move that Nash performed on Bischoff, while Tony proclaims that Eric led WCW into the 1990s, so... Now we're acknowledging Eric Bischoff as more than just an announcer. Tony Schiavone mentioning Eric Bischoff's position here in WCW. 
We also see clips of Mongo and Deborah turning on Kevin Green. And of course, we see clips of Arn Anderson also aiding Benoit and putting out Kevin Sullivan in the Falls Count Anywhere match. The announcers, though, hard selling the encore presentation tomorrow night on pay per view like no other. We'll talk a little bit more about that, if not the end of this episode of Monday Warfare, certainly next week here on Monday Warfare, why we're getting the hard sell all episode long on this special encore presentation of the pay per view. And that's why we're getting a lot of video stills instead of actual video footage, so everybody will tune into the pay-per-view. And like I said, 98.5% thumbs up by the Observer, so maybe maybe those who missed the pay-per-view would have been a good idea to grab the replay if you want to watch some good wrestling, some interesting angles. We continue on with the show, though. It's Mean Gene standing in the aisle in our very first interview with Ray Mysterio Jr. Mean Gene says he has never seen such acrobatics as he did at the Great American Bash between Rey Mysterio and Dean Malenko. However, Malenko used the ropes to get the win at the pay-per-view, and Mysterio admits he doesn't like the way Dean won. But Rey has his rematch here tonight, and he wants the Cruiserweight title. Rey with a little Spanish for those who speak the language, and off to the ring for a rematch between Cruiserweight champion Dean Malenko and Rey Mysterio Jr. Mike Tanay made his WCW debut last night at Bash of the Beach for this particular match, but no Mike Tanay in the rematch here today. As the match gets going, it's ground grabbing and feeling out. A monkey flip by Malenko, but Rey Mysterio landing on his feet. Moments later, a springboard moonsault press by Rey, but no cover. Malenko comes back, attempts a reverse crossbody, but misses. Mysterio capitalizes immediately with La Mahi Straw Cradle for a near fall. Mysterio, though, tries to get cute and gets clotheslined out of his boots by Malenko. Dean then working over the back and applies an awesome-looking half-crab, stretching Rey Mysterio in half. With this half crab, Dean Malenko almost sitting on his head. The match continues on. Dean with a nice looking brain buster for yet another two count. Then back to one of his thousand holds. Both men though fighting for a top rope spot later in the match. Knocking each other off the top rope. Malenko then with an electric chair drop for a two count. And then right back to a yet another of his 1000 holds. As the match continues on, Malenko busts out that nasty spike powerbomb of his. And goes for a Kawada cover. Gaining just another two count here. Malenko with a fallaway slam. He won't be doing that much longer. And right again, back to yet another of his 1,000 holes. This time, a camel clutch. Camel clutch, Bubba. Yalla. WWF champion. Mysterio escapes the clutch and out to the floor. As Dean is whipped hard into the guardrail, it's Mysterio to the top. Springboard to the top rope with a flying Hurricane Rana out to the floor. Amazing spot we've never seen before here. Ray then back to the top rope, but Dean follows him up. Rey Mysterio, though, with a sunset flip bomb off the top rope for a two count. Amazing. Mysterio then with an around the world body scissors into a roll up for yet another near fall. Rey then tries a reverse body scissors for a bulldog, but Dean counters into an inverted DDT. Won't be doing that much longer either. And gets the win here. Center of the ring. This time, no feet on the ropes. Malenko scores the pin over Mysterio. Eight minutes and 40 seconds. And there were some things here that I really hadn't seen before this. The, the Cruiserweight division begins now, guys. Mysterio has arrived. Malenko's already here. We know Guerrero and some of these other guys. Now, you might say, oh, my God, Dean Malenko just beat Rey Mysterio back-to-back in his first two matches in WCW. Well, you got to remember, guys, Rey Mysterio is new to WCW. He's new to American wrestling as, as far as the mainstream fans are concerned. And Dean is being established as the Cruiserweight champion at this time. And, and I'll admit, even here in 2022, it's still weird for me to see Dean Malenko beat Mysterio two nights in a row, but you have to put it in context for the time. Ray will go on to do much more in both WCW and the WWE. Hell, he's still there right now in 2022. Kudos to Ray Mysterio, but right here, right now, Dean Malenko picking up yet another win as more cruiserweights head into World Championship Wrestling. Off to another commercial, we get a bumper from Jimmy Hart and the Giant talking about their upcoming match against Scott Steiner, and then it's the old WCW Magazine commercial starring Garrett Bischoff, you know, the kid that morphs into Sting. Yeah, that was Eric Bischoff's son, Garrett, believe it or not. And hey, if you haven't heard it in the last 90 minutes, say hour and 40 minutes even, did you know there was a great American Bash Encore presentation? Yes, they continue to hard sell it throughout the entire two hours here of WCW Monday Nitro. As we head into the main event, it's WCW champion, the giant, Jimmy Hart in his corner, taking on Scott Steiner. And as Scotty makes his way to the ring, he's sporting taped ribs from earlier tonight due to that attack from Booker T off the top rope. And right away, Scotty goes for a German suplex, but he can't seem to lift the giant off his feet due to those injured ribs. 
but Scott does get the Giant up for a big slam, but his ribs give out and Giant falls on top. And then from there, the Giant goes to the ribs of Scott Steiner wisely. Going to the back and ribs of Steiner, Giant continues to pummel Scott on the floor and into the steel post as we head into a commercial break. Back from break and back inside the ring, the Giant stays on the ribs and back of Steiner. Not exciting, but at least it makes sense. This match has been all Giant, and we're seven minutes in at this point, guys. Big vertical suplex by the, I should say a giant vertical suplex by the Giant, but Scott keeps getting back up. Scotty, clothesline back to the floor, though, as the Giant goes to find a wooden chair. The same type of chair Scotty blasted him with last week on Nitro. More continuity. How about that? As the Giant tries to re-enter the ring, Scotty with a low blow, lifting that top rope into the crotch of the Giant, and then a chop block to take out the wheels of the big champion. Steiner then applies the sleeper, but the Giant breaks free. But he misses a corner charge, and holy shit, Scott Steiner busts out a T-bone suplex on the Giant, and the crowd comes unglued out of their seats after one very impressive move. It only took nine minutes for Scott Steiner to gain some offense. One move, and the crowd goes from quiet to erupting out of their seats. You can see it visibly happening. And Scotty goes for the cover, but the Giant kicks out. Unbelievable. Jimmy Hart then tries to interfere, which distracts the referee, Nick Patrick, allowing Scott Steiner to blast the Giant with the wooden chair, breaking it over the Giant's head. Who knows sells the chair shot? Giant then stares down a stunned Steiner and simply grabs him for the big choke slam. And the Giant retains the title in 10 minutes and 30 seconds. The Giant will retain, dominating the match. Scott Steiner selling his ribs for the majority of the match, using the chair and an impressive T-bone suplex. The Giant picks up the win with his finisher. 10 and a half minutes. But before we go on, let's talk about that T-bone suplex just for a minute. Scott Steiner launched the Giant, rocked the Giant with the T-bone suplex after like the Giant had dominated the match for nine whole minutes. But even so, even though the crowd sat on their hands for those nine minutes watching the Giant kick Steiner around the ring, they came unglued, popped out of their seat. They went crazy for the T-bone, which again shows you the difference between a live crowd on a two-hour WCW Nitro and the taped crowd over at Raw in the fourth hour of Monday Night Raw taping, sitting on their hands for pretty much everything. But kudos to the crowd for jumping up and and waking back up, even from the big spot, because the Giant just beating on Scott Steiner for 10 minutes was entirely too long. And I'll touch on this a little more right now while we have a moment. If you go back and watch this Nitro, listen to this Nitro as I did, the word overhype is an understatement here, because talking about overhyping a pay-per-view, I've never heard anybody overhype an encore presentation of a pay-per-view more than we heard the great American bash hyped here on this episode of Nitro. One of the reasons was the low buy rate. There were a lot of things going on that caused that low buy rate. And it was at this point, one of WCW's best pay-per-views in a very long time, wrestling wise and and storyline wise. And they felt if they could tell the story after the fact that Mongo turned heel, that Hall and Nash, Jackknife, Diesel, Jackknife, power bombs, Bischoff off the stage, all of these things coming together. They felt if they could tell this story on Nitro and show you some video clips or, or some pictures of the event, that maybe they'll have a pretty good encore presentation by rate. I don't really know how that turns out. Hopefully, in the future, observers, torches, things of that nature, will get an answer to that. But for right now, in case you watch this episode of Nitro along with me and you're wondering, what the hell are they doing? That was the reason why the oversell of the encore presentation They felt they really had a product to sell, and if they could tell the story again here on Nitro, they could get more buyers for the Tuesday night showing of the Great American Bash. And we're off to Mean Gene Oakland for the major announcement. Who will wrestle Hall, Nash, and the mystery partner at Bash at the Beach? We won't have to wait any longer. And throughout the entire Nitro broadcast, we've heard that everybody has put their name into the hat from Rey Mysterio Jr. to Paul Orndorff to Medusa. Everybody wants a piece of Hall, Nash, and their third mystery man. But only six names remained, the top six names in WCW, they proclaim. And only three of those names will go on to Bash at the Beach to meet what Mean Gene refers to now as the Outsiders, who still don't have names, still not Hall, still not Nash. They still try to figure out what they want to call these guys. And this is where Mean Gene confirms the names of the the final six. Of course, Hulk Hogan, the giant WCW champion, makes sense. Ric Flair, Sting, Lex Luger and the macho man Randy Savage. No arguments there. Your top six wrestlers in the WCW. And then the names were drawn. And the three names that will be competing 
at the Bash at the Beach pay-per-view against Hall Nash and their mystery partner will be none other than Lex Luger, the Macho Man Randy Savage, and Sting. Wow. And as we were going through this, I kind of figured, well, the Giants should defend his WCW title. Ric Flair just started this hot angle with the Horsemen. Mongo coming in doesn't really make sense for him to be part of this six-man match either. So you kind of narrow it down immediately to Sting, Luger, Savage, and Hogan. You almost automatically think that Hulk Hogan's going to be one of the names, brother, but he's not, which is intriguing. You'd think for sure that Hogan would want a piece of this one. Well, we'll have to wait and see what happens there. So, no Scott Hall or Kevin Nash this week on Nitro, and as a Mark back in 96, and a fan, of course, I'm sure that really bummed me out at the time, but from a booking point of view, the perfect week to get away with keeping them off TV was this week here, following the Great American Bash pay-per-view, especially after what Hall and Nash did to Bischoff. It makes you wonder, hey, maybe this is real, because if this was fake, they would have appeared on the show, but because they took Bischoff out, now they're suffering the consequences. So if you can suspend your disbelief and tell yourself these kind of stories, it's an intriguing storyline right now for WCW, this Hall and Nash storyline. And that'll wrap up this edition of Monday Nitro. So we talked segment of the night. Was it Macho Man versus Ric Flair? Was it Rey Mysterio and Dean Malenko in their rematch from the pay-per-view? Or the debut of Joe Gomez? Well, Joe Gomez, of course. I'm just shitting you guys. I think wrestling-wise, if you looked at it on paper, I'd call you crazy if you didn't pick Malenko versus Mysterio. But I did notice, and Dave Meltzer noted this in his review as well, Mysterio and Malenko are having solid matches, but they are not at the caliber that we expect from Rey Mysterio as of yet. Really good stuff. There are things I had never seen before up until this point in my lifetime from Mysterio here, but I can't give it the nod because I know what he goes on to do. I know what Malenko goes on to do. Lots of great matches coming, and a lot of the other cruiserweights headed in. So I'm going to go with what Dave Meltzer called the key to the ratings this week. And that's the Macho Man Randy Savage and Ric Flair. A fun little match. Savage gets back in the ring. Had to be a big deal. I'm sure that had some people tuning in. Not only to see Savage get his hands on Flair, but just to see the Macho Man back in action. Then, of course, every single horseman running in to interfere. It takes Mongo with a briefcase to finally put Savage down. Ric Flair picking up the win, stealing another one out from under the Macho Man. You keep waiting for the Macho Man to get his revenge, and you have to know it's got to be coming sooner or later. But for now, Flair pulls another one over on the Macho Man, while Savage, eh, he lives to fight another day, and even meaner and badder than ever, I'm sure. And? The ratings are in. And it appears that the June 17th Nitro coming off the Great American Bash pay-per-view drew a 3.2 for the first hour and a 3.6 for the second hour, with a combined rating of a 3.4 and a 5.9 share as compared to Raw doing a 2.3 and a 3.8 share. In the head-to-head hour, it was WCW's largest margin of victory ever. Even WCW's replay of Nitro later in the night did a 1.5 rating and a 3.8 share. That share, the same share that Raw did in its original hour. That replay of Nitro, also one of the highest-rated replays in Nitro history. So the buzz coming out of the Great American Bash pay-per-view... I'd say it was pretty good, and you can give some credit to Hall and Nash. You can give some credit, likely, to the Macho Man returning as well. But let's go back and look at this real quick. The first hour of Nitro, which was unopposed, did a 3.2 a little earlier in the evening, 8 o'clock p.m. But at 9 o'clock, up against Raw, Nitro jumps from a 3.2 to a 3.6. So Nitro does an even better number after Raw comes on the air. I don't think Vince was happy with that one, but of course... This was the fourth hour of a stagnant Raw taping. Not very good stuff coming out of the WWF right now on TV. And Nitro blows them out of the water with a combined rating of 3.4 to 2.3. But head-to-head, Nitro shatters Raw 3.6 to 2.3. Think about that. My, how the world turns. DeMelt says, after the 2.6 rating for Kevin Nash's debut last week, Kevin Sullivan, the booker, was totally in the doghouse to the point He wasn't even invited into a booking meeting on June 11th, and there was considerable speculation his days were numbered. By the next day, things were back to normal, though. The word was Sullivan had to agree to give up being an active performer after his current program finishes with Benoit to keep his booking job. Of course, after this week's rating, Kevin Sullivan now the company hero. So last week in the doghouse, potentially going to be fired from his job or removed from TV in order to do his job properly. 
This week, they're singing his praises. A clear case of what have you done for me lately? And it's fun to note, uh, the, the day following Nitro, this was June 17th, the day following Nitro, June 18th, at that point, nobody had put together the June 24th, the following Nitro show at all. That was to be held in Charlotte, North Carolina, and apparently the plan for WCW moving forward is to not book ahead. Yikes. We'll have to see how that works out. I think, given the NWO and given some of the other things going on in WCW, you kind of have to be loose with the booking in a lot of ways, but you got to have that long-term goal no matter what. So very interesting here. We learned that uh, by the middle of June, WCW has decided that they're not going to book in advance. And we'll just have to wait and see how that plays out in the long run. The real winner here is if there was even a doubt, Nitro shattered Raw in the ratings. Nitro also shattered Raw as far as competition here this week. Raw, absolutely, like I just said a few minutes ago, stagnant at best. It was the fourth hour of tapings. The crowd was dead, and they really didn't have a whole lot of good stuff on the program yet again this week. I love the announcement of Mr. Perfect as referee for the Sean and Bulldog match, but but this was your last big TV program heading into the King of the Ring pay-per-view, unless you count superstars. And we learned that Mr. Perfect's going to referee as the show goes off the air. There's really no sell job from Shawn Michaels. There's, there's nothing. Raw concludes, and it is what it is as we head into the pay-per-view. And as boring as the main event was between Jake and Goldust, they did a good job throughout the match of trying to keep people watching the program because they were going to make that announcement at the end of the show. So I get why they did what they did. But at the same time, I don't know the effect that it would have. I, I don't know. I just feel like they've done so much to damage this Bulldog and Shawn Michaels feud at this point. It doesn't really matter who the special referee is. Is Shawn Michaels in trouble? Absolutely. You have a heel, a former wrestler, now coming in to act as referee, and he's already had issues with you just recently, remember, with Diesel and Mr. Perfect working together against Shawn Michaels. And, of course, you can, you can talk about history there going all the way back to 1993, SummerSlam. But at the end of the day, just very little substance to the Monday Night Raw. Meanwhile, over on Nitro, we got Savage and Flair. We got Scott Steiner and the Giant. And even though it wasn't the most exciting of matches, on paper, when you look at that as your headliner, yeah, I want to check that out. I want to see what happens there. You slide in a Malenko Mysterio Cruiserweight title match. Big Bubba busting John Tenta across the face with a sack of money. And of course, the other ratings grabber, the Desperado Joe Gomez making his debut. But in all seriousness, all night long, Nitro tried to find ways to keep people tuning back in, clicking back over. And I thought they did a good job. And it's just like Raw made their announcement of Kurt Hennig at the end of the show. Nitro did the exact same thing. Find out who the three men are that will take on Hall Nash and their partner at the Bash of the Beast pay-per-view. We're going to announce it at the end of Nitro. And of course, so now you have to make your decision. Which channel do I want to flip to? Do I want to know who's refereeing the Bulldog Sean match? Or do I want to know who's going to main event? Who's going to headline? against these outsiders here in WCW. So two big secret announcements made at the end of the programs. I'm going to assume that WCW didn't do that by accident. But here on Monday Warfare, you got your answers to both of those questions, and I hope you guys enjoyed this episode discussing the Monday Night War. The real winner here this week, absolutely WCW Monday Nitro. I wonder how many times we're going to say that moving forward. And I hope you guys enjoyed another edition of the program. We'll be back again next time. The fallout from the King of the Ring. Who will be the 1996 King of the Ring? We'll have to wait and see. Will Shawn Michaels retain his WWF championship? Or will Mr. Perfect aid the British Bulldog in pulling a fast one over on old HBK? Also, Ahmed Johnson walking into the King of the Ring pay-per-view, taking on Goldust for the Intercontinental title. All of that. And the Body Donna's looking to debut their new manager here very soon. As things are looking partly cloudy for old Sonny. And as mentioned, no Hall and Nash this week on Nitro. We'll have to wait and see if they return next week as we discuss June 24th, 1996 in the Monday Night War. It is Raw versus Nitro, the WWF versus WCW. This has been your host, Ray Russell, and we'll be back next week with another edition of Monday Warfare, The Battles Within. Credit to the human race. But personally, I just can't stand him. I hate his guts. <laughs>